The following presentation is sponsored by the Alabama Department of Mental Health, Lifting Life's Possibilities, and Southern Coast ATTC, Unifying Science, Education, and Services to Transform Lives. Let's take a look at ASAM, and when they look at the PPC2R, we have more information for you regarding adolescence. We have in adolescence early intervention. We have level one, which is outpatient. We have level two, 2.1 and 2.5, which we've already learned about. We have level three. We have 3.1, 3.5, and 3.7. In the adolescent criteria, we don't have a 3.3. There is no 3.3. Does anybody remember what 3.3 is? Look on your cheat sheet. There's no medium intensity. We go from low intensity, right? Clinically managed low intensity, clinically managed medium, and then we go right up to medically monitored. We don't have that high intensity. Now that, don't, if you look here, we have low, medium, but no clinically managed high. It goes directly to medically monitored, okay? And you're gonna get another cheat sheet just for adolescents. We also have the medically managed intensive inpatient program. What I'd like to, for just one second, is just to let you know that in the ASAM PPC2R, there is a whole section just for adolescents. The um, <clears throat> clinicians and doctors that wrote this book were very, very inclusive to talk about adolescents specifically because they have different needs, they have different um, levels of functioning. We take a look at their educational level. When they're coming, we look at their brain development, they look at a whole lot of different things. So, we have point five. I find this a very exciting level of care for adolescents, specifically, because we're looking at exploring and addressing problems or risk factors, and we want to assist the adolescent in recognizing the harmful consequences of It's also intended to be a combination of prevention and treatment for at-risk youth, children of substance abusing parents. We mentioned DHR, so the parents come in, they have a substance abuse issue, we diagnose them, we put them in treatment, right? However, what about all the children of these parents? If they have significant risk factors, would they not benefit from a .5 level of care that we could, in, in conjunction with the parents being in traditional treatment, take a look at bringing the adolescents in for a .5 treatment. So looking at self-referral from the parent, when the parent brings up the issue, when you know a parent is having some, you know, in the treatment, would there be a place for a group for adolescents with parents who have been using? Because they're at risk, are they not? Where they can talk to other, other kids who have some of the same issues but have nobody to talk to and you're, you're correct. We also take a look at the length of service. No one's dictating and how long they stay in. We want to make sure that they're using the information that's provided to take a look at behavior changes. We don't want them to go from the risk factors to the diagnosis. And if at some point we see that those risk factors have escalated and they begin to use, what can we do from there? we can recommend a higher level of care. When we look at level one, it's also delivered in a wide variety of settings. It is six or less hours per week for level one. It requires that they do have a diagnosis. It can be the initial phase of treatment or a step down phase. Um, it can be an engagement phase when an adolescent is in the early stages of readiness for change, either those pre-contemplative stages or even the contemplative stage, and it can serve as an introduction to a higher level of care. 
when we were talking about the initial phase or the step down phase, if people are coming from a residential program, as an example, and they've been in treatment, I'm going to use the term 28 days because let's just, let's just say that for, for an example. We have someone who comes from a 28 day program, either for an adolescent or for an adult. Typically, what I've found in the past is that people come in at the IOP level three times a week, three hours a week, for eight weeks, or for 24 sessions. We can be much more creative because they've had a lot of that baseline information. We can be a lot more creative now and put them in a different level of care rather than the traditional levels of care. So we were talking before about um, naming some groups under like level one. We could have a group called what? Give me, give me an example under level one for adolescents or for adults. What were we talking about before? Do you remember? No, you don't remember. Under level one, nine hours or less than nine hours per week, we could have a relapse prevention group. We can call it whatever we want to. It's still a level one program. We could have a continuing care group, level one, less than nine hours or less than six for the adolescent. So you can name those levels of care, but you're still going to have a level one. We want to take a look at the severity of the adolescent's illness and we want to determine their response to treatment and that determines their length of stay. 2.1. 2.1 is an IOP, minimum of six hours of treatment per week. The treatment provider has the ability to provide linkages with other providers in the area. One of the things is with ASAM we don't have to do it all we can look at other providers in the area. We want to look at meeting before, during, or after school, or also on weekends. I don't know how many clinicians would be willing to work on weekends, but we have that capacity. It doesn't have to be so rigid. We want to take a look at how long they're in there based on their illness. Two point five meets twenty or more hours per week, daily or near daily contact, direct access to referral sources, access to educational services, and we provide treatment during school. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I worked in a treatment program that did this particular program. We did partial hospitalization, we did a two point five for the adolescent. They would come all day nine to five, whatever the, the hours were, and they did treatment, case management, all of those things, but they also had hired a teacher. The teacher was on staff at the partial hospitalization. She was the liaison between each one of the adolescents' schools, and she knew exactly where they were and what homework assignments they would have. So while they were in this 2.5, they were getting their, or their educational needs met so that when they completed the program, they could go back into the school system and be at the same place that they were with the other students. Does that make sense? <clears throat> when we look at level three, clinically managed low intensity, clinically managed medium intensity, and it's staffed by non-physician addiction specialist rather than medical or psychiatric personnel. When we look at the 3-7, we have the medically monitored high intensity, and they're under the direct supervision of a physician. These programs also look at functional deficits for the adolescent when we're looking at level three programs. We're looking at providing stable housing, <clears throat> and they have treatment services on site or they have treatment services provided with other treatment providers off site. But we want to make sure that there's close collaboration with what? The level three programs and the IOP programs. 
And you want to make sure that for the duration of service, it is specifically directed at the progress of the adolescent. And just as treatment plans should be individualized, we want to be able to individualize treatment. It's an organized service, level four, delivered in an acute inpatient setting. We want to look at the adolescent who has acute biomedical, emotional, behavioral, or cognitive problems that they're so severe that we're looking at the primary medical care and also the nursing care. These types of settings under level four, acute care general hospital, acute psychiatric hospital, or a psychiatric unit within an acute care general hospital. We want to be licensed substance abuse specialty hospitals with acute care medical and nursing staff. And it can, it determine, the length of stay is determined by their progress. Handout number six is the criteria 2001 cliff notes. Now this one, <clears throat> it's four pages long, so you can see down one side you have your dimensions, and then across the top you're going to have your levels of care. And this particular Cliff Note version is much more inclusive than the other one was. The ASAM PPC-2R is also very aware that there are co-occurring disorders. And we look at co-occurring disorders which in this particular case we're talking about mental health and substance related disorders but we also know that other co-occurring disorders can also be the biomedical disorders. For someone who's been in the field a long time these are some of the old terminology that was out there. Does anybody recognize any of those? You're shaking your head yes. Dual diagnosis. Dual diagnosis. What else? Dual disorders. Dual disorders. What I heard some more back here. MICA, who knows MICA? Yes, what's it stand for? Yeah, MICA was an old one. The one that I like a lot is the comorbid one. That sounds so energetic and so positive, doesn't it? You are not just morbid, but you are comorbid, okay? So you have more than one morbidity. Um, the other one was multiple vulnerabilities. So there are lots of terminology when we talk about co-occurring. Now in the, um, the PPC-2R, a lot of it, what you're going to see is the dual diagnosis terminology, but they also reference co-occurring. Co-occurring is the new terminology, as you're, I'm sure you're all aware, rather than dual diagnosis. We look at co-occurring. When we look at, and I put co-occurring in parentheses, the DDC is your dual diagnosis capable program. Um, it, the primary focus is your substance related disorders, but the program is also capable of treating individuals who have relatively stable coexisting mental health disorders or behavioral issues or cognitive issues. So we want to say that they're relatively stable that's your capable programs. When we look at dual diagnosis enhanced, we're looking at programs that their primary focus is treating individual who has more unstable or disabling co-occurring mental health disorders in addition to their substance abuse disorders. If someone came to the mental health counselor and the mental health counselor did the diagnosis, diagnostic impression, Somewhere down the road, we find out that there is a substance abuse disorder. It's almost like treatment stopped completely, and now we have to send them over to the substance abuse side. Now, for the substance person who was the, you know, the professional, if we came in and we had a mental health disorder that was not being treated, we stopped. We sent them over to mental health and we needed to get them stable before we could bring them into substance abuse treatment. So what I think the authors were saying is let's kind of get on the same page here and take a look at their coexisting conditions, their co-occurring conditions, and we need to be treating people 
as one entity. We don't shuffle them off over here for one thing. We don't treat them over here for another. We're going to bring this together and take a look at the person as a whole. The other terminology was the addiction-only services. And these programs, either by choice or lack of resources, really couldn't accommodate individuals who had a co-occurring disorder. 